Hey guys, I'm Scott. Here's how to support the show. Uh, first of all, sign up for the RSS feeds. And, you know, share them on Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff if you want. Um, you can sign up at patreon.com slash Scott Horton Show and just, uh, you know, donate two bits or eight bits or a dollar or whatever you want per interview if you want to do it on a per interview basis or just go to Scott Horton Show, uh, not that, scotthorton.org slash donate and uh, find out how to do all the PayPal stuff. And special thanks to everybody who does the uh, weekly or monthly donations there on PayPal. That stuff's really great and really helps out. Uh, and there's great kickbacks for gigantic single donations if you do that too. Shop Amazon.com via the link on the front page. If you do that, I get a kickback from their end of the sale. It doesn't cost you anything more. And uh, hey, why not write up a good review on iTunes and Stitcher? All right, you guys. Scott Horton here. For the Scott Horton Show, scotthorton.org, uh, on Twitter, at Scott Horton Show. And uh, check it out. I got Mark Perry on the line, Pentagon reporter, this time for the American Conservative magazine. That's theamericanconservative.com. Bannon and Kushner want to outsource Afghanistan to mercenaries. Welcome back. How are you doing? Good to be here, as always. Oh, and I should say, this is the spotlight today on antiwar.com, of course. So, yes, thank you, sir, for joining us on the show. I really appreciate it. Very important story here. Eric Prince of Blackwater, uh, back in business. Uh, what's his new company called now? Uh, Frontier Services Group, FSG. FSG. And they're teaming up with DynCore, who, uh, as you report in here, I think, uh, quoting somebody else, they already run Afghanistan anyway. They're, I guess, the biggest contractor, a huge contractor, uh, throughout the Afghan war, as it is. And now, as we've talked about before on the show, I believe, sir, um, you have Madison McMaster and the Pentagon staff. They're basically pulling a Petraeus McChrystal on uh, President uh, you know, Barack Trump here. The same kind of thing again, trying to roll him into a surge. And his political advisors are fighting back. But unlike Obama's political advisors... They actually have a plan, a, a whole different strategy for the war, um, and they're trying to push it. And so what is it uh, exactly, and what's the military think, and what's the president think? Seems like you're on top of all of this stuff. Well, if it were up to uh, Mr. Kushner and Mr. Bannon, we wouldn't have a surge, a troop surge in Afghanistan. I think that they understand politically the American people are tired of Afghanistan. But they're worried that they'll be blamed for losing Afghanistan. So what are they doing? They're turning over the war. They're proposing that the war be turned over to an American contractor, Eric Prince, and to Steve Feinberg, who is, runs a group called Cerberus, which runs DynCorp. What that means, uh, bottom line, is that the American war in Afghanistan would be turned over to mercenaries run by private corporations. Um, the president apparently likes the idea, although he hasn't said this publicly. He recommended that uh, Bannon take uh, Steve Feinberg of, of DynCorp in to see uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis to sell the idea. Mattis said no, but it's still out there. And under the plan, the CIA and would be contracting with these companies to run the war in Afghanistan, while apparently uh, the American military footprint would actually be drawn down. This is it. This is, uh, this is where America's going, guns for hire in foreign wars. It's a bad idea. There's a lot of opposition to it here in Washington. All right. Well, so let's start with the one part is that uh, everybody's sick of this war. And... People do want the military out. Maybe Madison McMaster don't want the military out, but the American people have been over the Afghan war for a long, long time now. And um, so that part's good. <laughs> you know, well, they, uh, they, they have a, 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 an important premise that they're working from here. But so what is it exactly then, Mark, that's so dangerous about having the CIA run a bunch of mercs in place of the U.S. Army and Marine Corps over there? Well, it's a it's a good question, and I've been thinking through what a good example of what happens to a country uh, in the midst of a war that is that becomes victimized by mercenaries. 
And I think the closest example and the current example that we have is Yemen. We have a humanitarian disaster in Yemen. Uh, the United Arab Emirates has been hiring out mercenaries to carry on the war in Yemen. Uh, starvation is stalking the country. Uh, the country is in absolute ruins. Uh, the war is endless. Uh, it's a it's a disaster. Uh, for those of your of our listeners who remember Somalia, it's it's akin to Somalia. It's a catastrophe. And the fear, I think, in, in official Washington, especially among adults like uh, Madison McMaster, is that turning Afghanistan over to the mercenaries, over to a guy like Eric Prince and Steve Feinberg, would would consign Afghanistan to the same kind of future that we see in Somalia and Yemen. It's a uh, it's a prescription for a humanitarian disaster, and uh, and not a win at all in any sense of the word. Mm. All right. So, um, yeah. And now specifically, I guess it's funny because you talk about in the article and, and I, maybe we can circle back to this because it's very interesting to me, the politics of this and, and how Eric Prince approached it versus how uh, Feinberg approached it and that kind of thing. But it seems like a major error in those pitching this plan. Is they're kind of saying right up front, yeah, and we're going to freeze you out, Mr. Secretary, whose decision it is whether to do this or not. Once you decide to do it our way, then you'll be turning the whole thing over to Langley, and you won't have any control whatsoever. And that's not a very good way to sell it. So what am I missing there? Are they, are they uh, trying to say, and then, yeah, we'll be taking this off of your hands, and won't that be a relief, Mr. Secretary, or what? Well, that's the selling point. Uh, you know, don't worry about Afghanistan. We'll take care of it. Now, that doesn't now, seem like the kind of thing Mattis wants to hear, though. He wants it to be his responsibility, doesn't he? I agree. Uh, you're you're exactly right. I, mean, I don't mean to give these guys advice. I'm just trying to figure out what's going on. Well, I, you know, l- listen, The Eric Prince wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal back end of May. Very interesting about how the United States should con- uh, conduct its future conflicts. Uh, taking into account that the American people are tired of these conflicts, his suggestion was that we take it out of the hands of the U.S. government. What that means is that you put it in the hands of American corporations who run wars like DynCorp and like Frontier Services Group. Uh, And his metaphor was this would be the East India Company, the British company that ran the colonial empire for the United Kingdom uh, in its heyday in the 17th and 18th and 19th century, that 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 Frontier Services Group and that and that uh, DynCorp would be the new East India Company. Wouldn't have to worry about deploying uh, the American military. You'd deploy uh, corporate assets hired and trained by corporations, and the American people wouldn't have to worry about it. Uh, wars would be run on the cheap. Uh, and there wouldn't be any body bags of American soldiers coming home. Uh, so it's, you know, it's kind of a, as I say in the article, it's kind of pitched as the perfect solution. Mm-hmm. You don't like wars? We'll take the wars out of your hands, and we'll make them part of our corporate structure. Amazing. Well, and see, here's the thing, though, is they would need, what, at least thousands of mercs if they're going to take over Bagram Air Base? And they're going to, what, wage war, uh, build up and support the Afghan National Army in trying to conquer Helmand Province and do a whole new surge or just a partial surge? Where are they going to get all those mercs? They're not going to hire that many Americans to do it, right? So they're going to, they're gonna like, like the UAE, they're just going to get <laughs> Colombians and Nigerians and whoever? Well, I don't, I don't know that you'd be surprised, but I'll say you'd be surprised, <laughs> I think, our listeners would be surprised at the number of people around the world who would sign up for $80,000 a year, $100,000 a year, $60,000 well, yes, a year to carry a gun and, and, and be deployed in a foreign country. It's pretty good money. You get an insurance program. Maybe you get a little pension. Uh, it's guns for hire. Listen, after all, the British did it during the American Revolution. They hired Hessians, right. uh, German troops, to fight the, the Continental Army made it easier on the British Empire. Didn't have to worry about the redcoats coming home in body bags. Didn't have to explain to the British people why you were fighting this stupid war against the colonists. 
This is the same kind of idea. The East India Company did it too for the British. Didn't have to explain to the British public what you were doing in South Asia and how many soldiers were there because there weren't any there. The East India Company was handling it. Yeah. It sounds like a very, you know, good solution if if you believe that we should be in Afghanistan to begin with. And I think that after 15 years, we probably shouldn't be. But that's a different debate. But if you're going to run these wars, then then the thinking of Eric Prince and Steve Feinberg is, let's let's try to do it without uh, pressing the American people too hard on something that is turning out to be very controversial, and it and it has a certain appeal. Now here's you know, but here's the problem outside of all the other humanitarian problems and and legal problems that this offers uh, is that it 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 really can't it can't possibly work. And you can be sure that H. R. McMaster in the White House and James Mattis in the Pentagon are absolutely dead set against this. Mm-hmm. The White House, you mean the National Security Council under McMaster? Under McMaster, yeah. yeah. Now, Bannon and Kushner are looking for, you know, good political solutions as well as good military solutions, and this has a certain appeal, I suppose. But, you know, I think the kind of unstated point that I make in the article is this is just sloppy foreign policy thinking. The American, you know, the American people are treated every evening to the latest Trumpgate, Russiagate scandal. Uh, but if you, if you take your eye off that for a minute and take a look at our foreign policy, uh, under the aegis of of Kushner and Bannon, it's an absolute chaos, and the and the people standing between us and this chaos are H. R. McMaster and Rex Tillerson, and James Mattis. They don't want anything to do with this, and I think I think that they'll probably kill it. It's not dead yet, but I think they'll probably kill this idea. Hmm. Well, so it's pretty well reported here, and I I wouldn't give the generals that much credit, but I see what you're saying that these other guys are kind of nuts. I mean, on the other hand, at least they're they're trying to sort of kind of wind the thing down or whatever. Where Madison McMaster, on the other side, they just want to extend the thing, right? Only with Army and Marines instead of Mercs. Listen, truth is that the bar here is very low. Our expectations of this administration are very low. If this was the Obama administration, this idea would have never gotten off the ground to begin with. Well, yeah, that's true. But, you know, here we are. And I think you know, I think that there's a hell of a debate going on in the national security establishment about exactly what we do in Afghanistan. And my sense is that that the resolution of this debate is going to be that Afghanistan really isn't the problem, that Pakistan is the problem. We're going to have to shape a new policy to deal with, to deal with Pakistan. I think we're in the process of shaping that policy now. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, so they keep saying that, and yet... What are their options? Cut off aid and threaten them a little bit. It seems like their best idea is threaten them by helping India or like get back at them sort of by helping India increase their presence in Afghanistan. But all that does is create more backlash and give the Pakistanis all that much more reason to keep back in the Taliban. Well, the same way it has been. You're exactly right, which is why we're not going to do that. But I do think we're going to get tougher on Pakistan. I think we're going to make it very clear to Pakistan that they have to move against the Taliban and bring them back to the negotiating table. That's really what people want here. We want to sit down with the Taliban and say, all right, you know, let's let's come to some kind of political solution where you can become a part of the government, um, where, you, you know, security is assured, where... Uh, your interests are represented, but our interests are represented too. That kind of political solution, getting the Taliban back to the negotiating table, is really what I think the goal of McMaster and and Mattis are. And it's and it's you know barring just picking up and leaving, it's probably the next best solution to the Afghanistan conflict. All right, hang on just one second. Hey guys, buy the War State by Mike Swanson. It's about the early days of the Cold War. You'll love it and get his investment advice at wallstreetwindow.com. Buy your precious metals at Roberts and Roberts Brokerage Inc. That's rrbi.co. Get your anti-government propaganda at libertystickers.com and your other printing at thebumpersticker.com. 3tediting.com if you want your book to read properly in English. And uh, is that... Yeah, that's probably not right. I need 3T editing myself, as you could tell. Uh, Tom Woods Liberty Classroom, sign up via the link on my page. You'll learn a lot, and I'll get a kickback. And Darren's Coffee, if you need coffee in the morning, Darren's Coffee Company 
at DarrensCoffee.com. Thanks. So that really is their plan is not just lean on the Pakistanis to stop backing the Afghan Taliban, but lean on the Pakistanis to basically negotiate on their behalf or force them to the table to maybe even threaten to, you know, withhold all aid and really turn against them if they don't negotiate a solution. But then so you're saying the Americans would agree to I mean, I'm trying to think of something realistic here i mean if they're going to make an agreement with the taliban it would have to be that they get half the country right they get the south and the east and we got to leave because the taliban aren't going to settle for less than that well we have said we have quietly been taking the temperature of the taliban for quite some time and uh, they always appear to be reticent whenever they think that they're winning on the battlefield so I think the goal of the administration would be to convince them that they're not going to win on the battlefield, that they ought to sit down. It wouldn't be um, they get one part of the country and the government gets the other. It would be that they would have to be participants in the government to begin with, and the government would have to agree to that. I think it's a longer negotiation. It's going to be a difficult negotiation, but, you know, there's no negotiation right now, and to get the Taliban back to the table, we're going to have to lean pretty heavily on Pakistan. I think the current thinking is that we're going to, we're, you're going to see that happening over the next six months. Yeah, but didn't Obama try that? And didn't they say, "Oh yeah, no, we're we'll definitely uh, talk to the Taliban about acting right," and yet it's in their interest to back the Taliban, <laughs> you know? Well, uh, Obama was not as harsh as the current. Um, thinking is there's a um, there's a really good thinker inside the National Security Council who works for McMaster her name is Lisa Curtis who I think understands Pakistan probably better than anybody in town that's my that's my view of her I have her article here that you link to in yours again by the way it's um, Mark Perry's article here guys it's Bannon and Kushner want to outsource Afghanistan to mercenaries and in fact this article by uh, uh, Lisa Curtis, you're talking about a new U.S. approach to Pakistan enforcing aid conditions without cutting ties. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but go ahead. Well, it's quite all right. I mean, I read that article about ten times, and I think it makes, you know, real sense. And if you if you hear her speak publicly about Pakistan, she really knows what she's talking about. Uh, and in early April, H.R. McMaster reached out to her and brought her into the National Security Council as kind of the thinker on South Asia and Pakistan. And I think that. She, that, you know, she's kind of the unknown official here. It's Mattis McMaster and Lisa Curtis who are trying to put together mm -hmm. a strategy for Afghanistan that works. And I think that uh, McMaster and Mattis are probably following her lead on this. She has very good thinking on Pakistan. Now, listen, if, you know, if, if you're a non-interventionist like me, you kind of, you know, look askance at, uh, at all of this and saying, geez, we're going to try to recreate the wheel again. But as I say, the bar is pretty low. If we're looking for solutions on foreign policy and you really want those solutions to come from people who know what they're talking about, Lisa Curtis knows what she's talking about. And uh, we could do a lot worse than by listening to her. And certainly we could do a lot worse if we listen to somebody like uh, Kushner, Bannon, Prince, and, and Feinberg. I think the adults in the room, McMaster, Madison, Curtis, ought to be allowed to take the lead here, and let's see where it goes. Hmm. Well, I mean, it's, as you say, slim pickings. Um, and and uh, I guess, you know, I I haven't read her uh, her article yet, but uh, I don't know. I don't know what's changed that would really um, signify a, a Taliban willingness to negotiate when they've said all along that we won't negotiate until – the Americans leave, or at least agree up front that they're leaving at the end of the negotiation, at the very least. And yet the Americans don't want to ever leave, and they want to send thousands more troops, right? Well, I, you know, there's a there's talk in town of a um, of a mini surge of enablers. These are these wouldn't be combat troops; these would be logistics, aviation trainers, people like that. And I think that's a done deal. Uh, 4,000 extra troops to do that, to kind of buttress up, to buttress the central government. Uh, and that's that's a very 
uh, non-controversial offering that, that's on the table right now, and I think that'll be approved. Over and above that is the issue. And, you know, if the choice here is between listening to McManus, McMaster, and Lisa Curtis, who would like to conduct a war that they believe is in America's interest. You can disagree or agree with that. That's far better than turning a war over to uh, people like Prince and Feinberg who are interested in the profit motive. Uh, And it's far easier to get out um, eventually if you have American soldiers bearing the brunt of the fighting rather than mercenaries. You know, this isn't the kind of thing that the American people should forget about. I know that we're consumed by Russiagate, but we're conducting a war in Afghanistan, and American soldiers are in danger, and and we're not doing well. And so this is something we need to focus on, and there are clear choices here. The choice here is between a policy that's an American policy, whether you agree with it or, or disagree with it, and a in a policy that's a for-profit policy, which I think is, could be a disaster for Afghanistan, a disaster for the country. Yeah. Well, and I'm sorry for getting so far off topic with the, the uh, mercenary thing here. I mean, it seems like uh, probably we're going to get both, right? We're going to, they're going to make some kind of compromise and say, well, we're going to send a bunch of mercenaries too, something like that. I mean, it sounds like, and, and I meant to let you talk about this earlier, um, uh, you mentioned here about how Eric Prince went marching on in there and got into a you know chess beating contest with McMaster and lost. But that Feinberg is a lot smarter, and Feinberg went and recruited all of Mattis's best friends to talk to him for him and this kind of thing. Can you elaborate a little bit and name some names and help us understand that? Because this is a very uh, well reported piece here. You talk to people on the National Security Council and in the military, and and got a lot of perspective on. The, the politics of, of the people who are working on getting this thing done? Well, I, you know, uh, I appreciate the compliment. And I, you know, it, the article took me a while to put together, obviously, and there were very few people who were willing to talk to me uh, on the record. But, you know, the kind of the short story here is that Steve Feinberg understands that if he comes off as a guy who's simply interested in the profit motive, his initiative of turning this war over to uh, corporate America is not going to work. Uh, so he recruited uh, very robust and respected officials. The head of DynCorp, the new head of DynCorp is George Crevo, who is actually a very talented uh, military officer, retired as a lieutenant colonel. Uh, Michael Gefeller is a known quantity, worked at ExxonMobil, worked 26 years as a diplomat, highly respected uh, in town, uh, plus Feinberg, and uh, my understanding is that Steve Feinberg has on his side on this issue uh, some pretty heavy-hitting former agency, that is to say CIA intelligence officers, who think that this is a good idea. Uh, And and the idea is that, you know, it's not as if the war wouldn't be unmonitored. This war and and and, and the Feinberg kind of Prince initiative would be overseen by the CIA. So what we're seeing right now in Washington, and I won't take credit, but I think partially as a result of the article, is a debate inside the intelligence services about whether this is a good idea. And uh, there are people who are Asia hands, who've worked at the agency for years and years and years, uh, and I've overseen the Afghanistan conflict, who are dead set against this and are weighing in with the CIA director, Mike Pompeo, to to nix this uh, hasn't happened yet but well, that's i think good to hear, but I, uh, isn't but this think, their game plan all along the cia with their counterterrorism pursuit teams and all this stuff is i guess they're that's more hiring local mercs than nigerians but well one of the complaints about the agency over the years over the last 15 years is that it's been um increasingly militarized and i think we're seeing the result of that that you, you know and this Part of this bureaucratic battle, there's a lot of there are a lot of people in the CIA who would who would like to take over for the U.S. military around the world, who think that you know that kind of the twilight struggle means hiring twilight lawyers, and this is the way to do it. What's interesting is that after the article appeared, I which is what normally happens with me, what, you know, the article appears, and I get 
telephone calls from people inside the Pentagon and especially in the retired set of uh, former intelligence officers who are influential. And it was in, it was interesting that the calls were evenly divided between those who said, "I'm oh, Mark, this is dead on arrival. It'll, it'll never work," and and don't worry about it. Uh, and and another group of people who said, "This is very very much alive." Now what that you know what that tells me is that this is this is currently being debated uh, uh, inside the CIA. I think I think Mattis just discounts this. this is, if he has his way, this will never happen. If H.R. McMaster has his way, this war will never be turned over to Merck's. It's just not going to happen. But there's a certain appeal here to privatizing our military adventures and and kind of <clears throat> lessening the military footprint and and taking you know the Afghanistan conflict and all of our overseas conflicts off the front pages and mm-hmm. out of the radar screen of the American people. Well, it's like hiring it. drones. It's the yeah. same kind of thing. Yeah, that's right. And I, you know, I, there, there's this, you know, I don't think we should say this is outrageous, ridiculous. You know, there's, these guys make a strong case. They have lots of allies. Mm-hmm. They want to do this. And the American people are sick of the Afghanistan war. This is a way to offload it. That's mm-hmm. their political play. And it's not a bad one. Mm-hmm. Well, and as you say in here, reportedly, apparently, I guess it, you're reporting that Donald Trump read the Wall Street Journal piece by Prince about, yeah, we ought to have a viceroy. It's just like the actual movie, War, Inc., the John Cusack flick. I have a viceroy and turn the whole war over to the Mercs, and Trump really liked it and said, yeah, hey, it, yeah, let's look into this further, guys. You know, for Trump, I mean, this, you know, I often say this, and it, it seems to have a certain resonance or appeal with some people, is Trump is the kind of guy, uh, I suppose, our listeners would would kind of tie him to, you know, a guy like Tony Soprano. I mean, he spends, you know, he spends the day at the Bada Bing, and he comes home at night, and he watches the BBC series The World at War, and, and the military has a certain appeal to him. He always says this, oh, I love the military, they love me, I know more about war than, well, what he knows about war is what he sees on uh, on on television, this guy is not a reader. Uh, when I said that he read the Eric Prince article, people called me and said he didn't read it. Yeah, somebody um, told him about it. <laughs> yeah, Steve Bannon read it for him and highlighted it and gave it to McMaster. That's what happened. Well, I don't know that. I think he probably read the article, but this has a certain appeal to him. It's a way of 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 winning without you know telling the American people that their sons and daughters are engaged in another 16-year adventure. So uh, I think I, and I, and he trusts a guy like Eric Prince. For for Donald Trump, a guy like Eric Prince is a great hero. I mean, he's an adventurer. He's kind of a swashbuckler. He understands how to run a business. It's especially true of Steve Feinberg, who's a very good friend of, of, uh, of Eric Prince's and who's running a company that, you know, can do this kind of thing. So the appeal there for Donald Trump is very real. And that's the danger. This sounds like an easy solution. It's not so easy. Yeah. All right, now, I'm sorry. So back to the troops again. Assuming that McMaster and Mattis just, and Pompeo, for that matter, shoot this thing down and just say this is unworkable. And we're back to the the regular question of troops. You said the 4,000 you think is a done deal. Do you have an estimate for when they're going to announce that. And of course, I'm sorry, because I have a very vested interest in the timing here. Because if they're going to announce it in a couple of weeks or, yeah, you know, at the end of this month, then I'm going to publish my book at the end of this month. But if huh. if this is 2009 and they're going to keep arguing about this thing into September and and later than that, then I need to go ahead and just publish it now so that my book can take part in this fight. But if my book is... If it's going to be dead on a right, if, if it's going to be obsolete by the time I publish it, I need to go ahead and wait. You know what I mean? Well, welcome to my world. And yeah. I, you know, and um, I, I keep getting emails from you saying, you know, when are they going to decide this? When are they going to decide this? And I keep responding saying, I don't know, but soon. Yeah, two weeks. Two weeks. And, I, and I've been saying that for two months and they still haven't decided. It's like that movie, The Money Pit. 
Two weeks. Yeah. We'll be done two in two weeks. Two weeks, two weeks. Well, it, it never quite happens. And I think that we're still a ways away. Uh, but I do believe that at the end of the day, uh, the kind of Bannon, Kushner, Prince, Feinberg initiative to privatize this war will fail. It just It's not going to work. It's too chancy. The details are too slippery. Uh and, and people are very uncomfortable with it. And I think that will be adopted instead is a very robust, very aggressive, diplomatic, and military policy that targets the Taliban in Pakistan and that pushes Pakistan hard to bring the Taliban back to the table. I think that that's what people believe the solution is. They're probably right, which means that eventually, not today, not tomorrow, not next week, probably not even next year, but sooner or later, there's no question, the United States is headed out of Afghanistan and looking for a political solution. Yeah. You know, I don't know. <laughs> it seems like, uh, yeah, but what about the Haganis? And what about all the insurgent fighters who don't take no orders from no Taliban? <laughs> and what about the reality of this war? I mean, all this still sounds fantastic. Going to somehow negotiate. Mattis just said the other day, why would I negotiate with somebody who he just asserts could never win at the ballot box? That's why they fight, because they can't win at the ballot box. So how am I going to turn civilization over to some beasts like that? It doesn't sound like he's ready to negotiate with them at all. Well, um, James Mattis talks a pretty tough game. Uh, And we noticed this recently. He was very, very tough on Iran. Uh, but when it really came down to whether we stay inside the agreement that we had with Iran or whether we break that agreement, he came down on the side of staying inside the agreement. Yeah. So he, you know, James Mattis kind of got a pounds the table very effectively. But he's a Democrat. He's not a Trump Republican. I mean, that's the big secret in Washington. He's, he's a Democrat. Yes, he's an interventionist, but he's a very careful man. And... I think that we're going to see that him banging the table on Afghanistan and Pakistan, but it really comes down to it. He'd much rather have a diplomatic solution than anything else here. I hope that's right. All right, well, listen, I'll let you go. Thanks very much for coming back on the show, Mark. I really appreciate it. Listen, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. All right, you guys, that's the great Mark Perry. He's a Pentagon reporter. You can find him a lot of times in Politico magazine, and here he is at the American Conservative magazine exclusive. Bannon and Kushner want to outsource Afghanistan to mercenaries. And uh, by the way, he's got a brand new book coming out too, The Pentagon's Wars. will be out in October. I'm Scott Horton. Check out the archives at scotthorton.org. Follow me on Twitter at Scott Horton Show.